war and peace, prosperity and downfall. The Silk Road was also a battle road. To the west of Pakistan tower the Suleiman Mountains, which border on Afghanistan. Nomads, caravans, conquerors, and anyone else passing this way had to use this single slope running through these mountains. This is the world famous Khyber Pass. The border checkpoint is at the western foot of the Khyber Pass. This is the Torham checkpoint on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Beyond the iron fences is Afghanistan. The road straight ahead leads as far as Iran and Rome. Border guards of Afghanistan. The Soviet army's entry into Afghanistan has made it difficult for foreigners to cross the border. Our team is no exception, and we are unable to take this road westward. But as we watch, a number of people and cars pass through the checkpoint. This privilege is granted only to those living in the border area who used to enjoy free passage. A white borderline is drawn on the mountain surface, a symbol of an unconquerable political barrier for us, reporters on the Silk Road, who must keep travelling. Departure to the east from the border. Our new travel route is to traverse Pakistan from west to east and reach India, the birthplace of Buddhism. On our way to the top of the pass, we encountered a nomad family traveling with camels. They said they were heading for Afghanistan, crossing the Torkham border. The nomads travel a distance of three to five hundred kilometers, and this is nothing unusual for them. The goods bought and sold by the nomads may have often contributed to cultural exchange between East and West in world history. Contrary to our expectations, the Khyber Pass is much larger than we had anticipated. 
It covers a vast area, stretching some 20 kilometers from east to west, with many villages in the valleys. Of these villages, Landicottel is the largest. The village bazaar is always busy. Because of the low prices, many people come here all the way from Afghanistan, crossing the border. Pakistanis cannot live without spices. Spices are the most conspicuous articles at the bazaar. To our surprise, every man is armed with a gun. It is considered a symbol of full-fledged manhood. The men are of the Pushto tribe. The people of the Pushto tribe live on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan and are known for their dauntless spirit. These are the houses of the Pushtos. These fortress-like buildings are scattered around the area of the pass. After repeated negotiations, our team finally got permission to shoot the interior of this building, the house of a man who may be called the Malik of the tribe living in the neighborhood. The single condition was that we should take no pictures of women. We were very tense when we arrived, but Malik Nazar cordially welcomed us with a large group of friends and relatives. This uh, about one year before I started this. One is already. Uh, my uh, old house was the, before the Hujra. Now my brother, three brother, uh, remain there, and I came here. I see. Uh. Surrounded by men with guns, we were ushered into the house. In this area, in this here, like this, there is about. Inside the brown earthen wall, the house was more spacious than we had expected, and the construction was quite modern. The rooms were perfectly air conditioned. Only I and my four children. But my one children has Malik Nazar has a wife and four children, but he and his family live together with 200 relatives within the same plot. Along the wall, seven meters high, is like a maze. Within the plot are various facilities to be used exclusively by the clan, such as a mosque and a school. Malik Nazar's first son and his wife is under construction. In one of its corners, an observation tower with a peephole has been built. Gunmen conceal themselves here when fighting breaks out. 
an observation tower is something indispensable for the houses of the Pushto tribe. On the third day after our first visit to Malik Nazar, our team had an opportunity to witness a very unusual event. A kind of trial called Jirga was being held. When trouble or conflict occurs within the tribe, it is a custom for the elders to gather together and settle the matter. At the court, two opposing parties quarrelling over an inheritance were trying to justify their claims in the presence of the elders. The dispute has been going on for years. The role of Jirga is to hear the appeals of two parties and make a ruling agreeable to both. Even a murder case is given a hearing in this court. Self-rule and self-judgment are the law of the proud Pushtu tribe. Ten kilometers to the east of the border checkpoint, the mountain path reaches the top of the Khaiba Pass. This is a monument to an army corps that once crossed the Khyber Pass and conquered the area. Timur, king of the grassland, passed through this road and so did Genghis Khan and his troops. But there was a king who crossed the Khyber Pass from west to east, centuries before them. In the 4th century BC, there was a king who dominated a peninsula projecting into the Mediterranean. The Macedonian king to the north of Greece had a long cherished ambition to advance his army to the east. About that time, West Asia was under the prosperous rule of the great Persian Empire. So an eastward advance of the army of newly established Macedonia inevitably meant a showdown with Persia. 
Finally, in the spring of 334 BC, the Macedonian army, 35,000 strong, crossed the Dardanus Strait. The commander-in-chief of this Macedonian army was, of course, Alexander the Great, who had studied under Aristotle in his youth and is believed to have carried world history with him. The other shore of the narrow strait was the territory of the Persian Empire. The Allied forces of Macedonia and Greece, led by Alexander, the huge Persian army. The two sides confronted each other at the plains of Isos to the south of Turkey. This painting from the 16th century vividly depicts one of the fiercest moments of the battle. Riding on a white horse, Alexander the Great penetrated deep into the enemy camp. Turning his back on the enemy, the Persian king, Darius III, is about to flee. Alexander, after defeating Darius' army at the Battle of Isos, again put the Persian army to flight on the occasion of their second showdown. This brought to an end the Persian age and the Archimenid dynasty, a reign which boasted of pomp and glory. Having conquered Babylon, Susa, Persepolis and other Persian cities, Alexander the Great continues his military advance farther to the east. In 327 BC, Alexander's army finally reached the Kheba Pass. It was a march of 10,000 kilometers lasting over a period of seven years. The road used during these wars laid the foundation for the Silk Road. Twenty kilometers to the east of the Kheba Pass lies Peshawar, the central city of the Gandhara Plains. The bazaar along the main street is jammed with crowds and congested with car traffic. In the olden days, minstrels used to stand on the street corner to recite love romances or epics of legendary heroes. Every man we meet here invariably wears either a hat or a turban. We can tell which region he's from by the shape of his hat or turban. Round hats belong to the Pushto tribe. A man from Afghanistan wraps up his head loosely with a piece of long cloth. These men do not simply wrap their heads with cloth. They take secret fashionable delight in wearing vivid colored hats underneath, which peek out at the back of their turbans.
a tea house called Chaikana. When a cup of tea is ordered, a man makes it whilst balancing himself holding a piece of rope hung from the ceiling. A cup of tea costs about 26 cents. People of Peshawar are great tea lovers. They plant themselves in the parlor of Chaikhana and leisurely enjoy black Indian tea or Chinese green tea. While refreshing themselves with tea, they keep on talking, whether about business matters or personal affairs. The atmosphere of Chaikhana in Peshawar now is unchanged from that of ancient times. Once in the inner alleys of the bazaar, there are more reminders of the Silk Road age. On the veranda facing the courtyard, a group of craftsmen skilled in traditional gold work are displaying their abilities. They are making rings, bracelets, earrings and so on. They look like father and children, but actually they are master and his apprentices. These children make it a rule to visit here every day after school. When will I be able to make these beautiful things by myself? A cute little six-year-old boy, earnest in his desire to help his master. This is the busiest street in the bazaar, flanked by rows of shops specializing in copper works. Daily necessities such as pans, pots, pitchers are being made using only a small mallet. Apart from the experienced craftsmen and their excellent works, the success story told by the proprietor is another charm of the bazaar. Copper pieces. He's my copper work in the world best. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. These all made by hand, no machine. Mm -hmm. In Pakistan, in Gujranwala, Lahore, Karachi, many make it, but this also work is a by machine. Uh -huh. But this work, my work is also by hand. And you see this piece, sir, this is no one piece. This is ten pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, like this design. Small, small piece join, and this I make it. Uh -huh. But one, my work is this one. These work in the world best. And these make it, I am alone set in the world. Second difference design. So you are yes. a very rich person. Oh, no, sir. You believe me, my name is Ali. Uh -huh. But not Prince Ali, just poor Ali. Uh -huh. And people come to my shop, I tell him, uh -huh. in the world, five Ali. <laughs> yeah. First, line of the God. Yeah. Second, Ali Baba and 40 thieves. Uh -huh. Third, Prince Ali Khan. Yeah. Four, Muhammad Ali Kile. Yeah. And five, poor honest Ali. <laughs> no money, but in God we trust. Uh -huh. The water of the Indus River running through the Gandhara Plains is clear and blue. The brown muddy water belongs to the Kabul River flowing from the west.
the Indus and Kabul join here at Atuk to become one river. They say that it's in this neighborhood that Alexander the Great, leading his army, forded the river as he continued to advance in his eastward attack. When Alexander and his army advanced eastward, it was as if they took Greece itself with them. In many places they conquered, they built towns and called them Alexandria. Here in Taxila, too, remains of the Greek-style living are found. Pantheons, theatres, houses, all the structures here were built after the Greek fashion. The soldiers were encouraged to marry native women, and thus Greek blood was transmitted through the generations. Sculptors were told to follow the Greek manner. Greece in the west and India in the east, though they are several thousand kilometers apart, they were brought together a long time ago through fierce battles. In 327 BC, the army of Alexander the Great was divided into two groups to cross the Kheba Pass and the Hindu Kush mountains. The Swat region to the north of Gandhara was the first target of Alexander's attack. Swat abounds in mountain castles. Tens of thousands of soldiers pushed their way up the steep mountainside. Led by Alexander the Great, the Macedonian army continued its attack. This is the impregnable castle of Mingora, which is believed to be the site of the fiercest battles in Swat. Resistance by the powerful native families was intense. With every battle, soldiers were killed and grave posts were erected. Let's advance eastward, for beyond the Indus River lies a rich land. So saying, Alexander the Great tried to raise the morale of his entire army. However, five large tributaries of the Indus forced them to carry out several risky river fording operations. Their new enemy beyond the river was a huge herd of elephants that came thundering down on the army. The soldiers were terror-stricken. They had never been confronted with such a formidable enemy before. They had defeated Darius' army at the battlefield of Isos, conquered one Persian city after another. Already many years had passed since they had left Macedonia. All these years were spent in never-ending wars. The soldiers 
who had unprotestingly followed the king eastwards, finally raised their voices. Let's return to the west, your majesty. Somewhere, there must be a vast and rich land, as yet undiscovered. This is what motivated the king to make his military advance towards the east. However, now when he heard the voices of his soldiers, Alexander the Great gave up his ambition of eastern advance, although the five tributaries of the Indus were just before him. Although Alexander's army turned back here, they left behind a legacy for future generations. Cities called Alexandria built along the route of battles, as well as a large number of Greeks who settled there. That was the beginning of the contact between the East and the West, and of the thrilling history of the Silk Road. This area, with its impressive vivid green wheat fields, lies at the eastern tip of Gandhara. A gigantic stupa, soaring 30 meters high, seems to bespeak the past prosperity of Buddhism. Buddhism, which originated in India, is believed to have spread to the Gandhara region by the 3rd century BC, soon after the death of Alexander the Great. People from the West, who had settled in this region, became attracted to the Oriental teachings of Buddhism, without their realizing it. The historic remains near Sealcott, in the vicinity of the Indian border, are believed to be those of a town occupied by a Greek king, whose name was Menada. King Menada, who reigned over this region in the second century BC, was fond of learning. He took a particularly deep interest in Buddhism, but Buddhism was not so easy for the Greek king to understand. One day, a Buddhist priest appeared before the king. This priest was the Buddhist sage, Nagasena.
the sage and the king had a profound discussion about Buddhism. This dialogue between the two, known as King Menander's Questions, was brought to Japan in ancient times in the form of a book of sutra named after Nagasena. King Menada visited Nagasena at his palace with a large entourage of his Greek subjects. The moment their eyes met, the king said to the Buddhist sage, many a time have I heard eloquent speakers and I have had discussions with them, but at no time have I felt greater thrill in my heart than in the talk I am having with you now. According to the ancient record, the dialogue between King Menander and the Buddhist sage Nagasena was watched by more than 80,000 people. It was King Menander who first spoke to raise a question. What is the first and foremost goal of Buddhism? Our ultimate goal is to completely wipe out our worldly desires and uncleanness and attain the state of nirvana which leads to perfection of enlightened wisdom. Do all people who become Buddhist priests reach that goal? Your Majesty King Menada, that is not the case. Some people go into religion to escape from an intimidating king or a burden of debt. But those with a pure and correct motivation try to attain the state of nirvana. Nagasena, do you mean to say that it is possible for them to know that nirvana brings comfort even without actually attaining that state or spirit of enlightenment? Yes, it's possible for them to know. But how? What would you think, Your Majesty? Do you think that it is possible for us to feel the pain of amputating our limb without actually experiencing it? That's certainly possible. Why do you think so? Because they have probably heard the painful cry of someone else who has had his limb amputated. It's the same thing, Your Majesty. People who have not yet attained the state of Nirvana can know that it means comfort just by hearing from others. King Menada threw one question after another at the priest and tried to refute him. What is metempsychosis or transmigration of soul? What is Buddhistic emancipation? Does Buddha really exist? Thus continued the dialogue between the two for hours. It was such a heart-moving experience that the king is said to have been converted to Buddhism in the end. Here we find objects that clearly embody in tangible form the encounter between East and West. An encounter which had advanced to the level of heart-to-heart -heart communication. The numerous Gandhara Buddhist images excavated from sites all over this area. This is the statue of a goddess that looks like Venus, the Greek goddess. But actually, this is an image of a Buddha in attendance, 
sitting beside the principal Buddha image. The Gandhara Buddhist images of earlier times were modeled on Greek gods, such as Zeus and Apollo. This one, with a face somewhat resembling that of a Greek god, holds some flowers as an offering for the Buddha. With abundant and wavy hair, the Buddhist image is in exactly the Hellenist style. An extremely realistic representation of pleats of the robe. A statue of Bodhisattva wearing gorgeous breast ornaments and necklaces. This is one of the masterpieces of the Gandhara Buddhist images. A prominent nose and a moustache convey to us the flavour of the West. His flower-bedecked hair is abundant and wavy and gives us an impression entirely different from the one we get from the Buddhist images found in China or Japan in more recent years. The hairstyle of the Buddhist images gradually changed and developed into a style unique to the Gandhara Buddhist images. Though the features of this Buddha retain a Western cast, his fingers make signs symbolic of Buddhist teachings. The merciful facial expression of the Buddha contains the flavor of faraway Greece. The Gandhara Buddhist images do in fact tell us about the mysterious roles played by the Silk Road. the ancient city of Lahore on the Indian border. When our team of Silk Road reporters visited Lahore, the people of the city were gathered at the mosque. For Muslims, daily prayer is something they can never do without. They all prostrate themselves in the direction of distant Mecca, bowing till their foreheads touch the ground. Before prayer, they cleanse their bodies. This is Badshahi Masjid. Prayer is performed five times a day. Before the overwhelming power of the Quran, Buddhism finds no place here. It is pushed back into the veil of history.
The Silk Road is full of footprints of world history. Today, Islamic teachings have taken deep root on this road where the conquering king once passed. <laughs> 